if I'm gonna record and now I'm gonna get I'm gonna admit a uh, 50 people to the people from Facebook Live welcome we're gonna start this seminar in a couple of seconds Welcome everyone to the Council on Hemispheric Affairs COHA. This is Patricio Zamorano. I'm the co-director of this think tank based on Washington DC that for 45 years have been working to contribute to the continental dialogue in the Americas, trying to establish positive and constructive bridges of dialogue south-north based on progressive values, academic integrity, and insightful analysis. We have a great event today titled Venezuela, Iran, a natural uh, uh, alliance in the face of illegal sanctions, engaging with the South-South dialogue that through multilateralism and the creation of alternative centers of powers and international cooperation has created new alliances and new ways to face unilateral sanctions, especially from the U.S. Unilateral sanctions against nations are not allowed by the international law and the spirit and the letter of the United Nations. We have international organizations to deal with economic, uh, with economic disagreement uh, and political and diplomatic confrontations. However, for the last decades, the U.S. has implemented numerous political strategies outside these legal avenues to fulfill his, its strategic interests. Today we will be analyzing the situation of one of these permanent confrontations against the governments of Iran and Venezuela and the way the illegal U.S. sanctions have shaped a new alliance between these countries. For this we have two great academic speakers, renowned academic lawyer and author Dan Kovalik. He teaches international human rights at the University of Pittsburgh a School of Law and is the author of several books, among them The Plot of Overthrow Venezuela, The Plot to Overthrow Venezuela and The Plot to Attack uh, Iran. Dan is maybe one of the most authorized voices in this subject, the, the, uh, the alliance between Iran and Venezuela in the context of the U.S. sanctions. Uh, Dan Kovalik is also senior research fellow at our organization, COHA, the Council on Hemispheric Affairs. Please, Dan, welcome. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Dan. We also uh, we are also honored to have with us today uh, Professor Fouad Isadi. Uh, he's Associate Professor in American Studies at the Faculty of World Studies, University of Tehran. It's a real pleasure. Welcome, Fouad. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, we also have the presence of our COHA Senior Research Fellows. We will introduce them little by little. We have Alina Duarte, we have Danny Shaw, Professor Danny Shaw from New York, and we also our Editorial Assistant, Jill Clark Golov. Uh, now, let me pass the mic to our co-director of COHA and professor of philosophy at Bowie State University, Fred Mills, who will lead the conversation with our speakers today. After 30 minutes of analysis, we will open the floor for questions and answers from all, your, uh, all of you participants of this great event. Thank you so much. Welcome to the Council on Hemispheric Affairs. Uh, professor Mills, you have the mic. Thank you, Patricio, and welcome everyone to this timely webinar. Uh, we're reflecting today on the Venezuela-Iran relationship at a time when both countries are under attack by Washington in a hybrid form of warfare that combines economic sanctions with the threat of direct military intervention. At different times over the past two decades, the two nations have provided lifelines to each other 
and most recently uh, with the Iranian fuel shipments to Venezuela in exchange for gold and petroleum crude. When President Chavez visited Tehran in 2010 to meet with Iranian President Ahmadinejad and the two pledged mutual support, this was part of a long-standing relationship. And 10 years later, Venezuelan Foreign Minister Jorge Arriaza went to Tehran to meet with his counterpart, Mohammed Javad Zarif, to further cement this relationship. Now, why do we call it a natural alliance? Despite their ideological differences, there's a lot of historic analogies. Uh, Iran suffered a US-backed coup against a democratically elected government, Prime Minister Mohammed Mossadegh in 1953, and Venezuela suffered a short-lived coup against the democratically elected President Hugo Chavez in 2002, a coup that was immediately endorsed by Washington. Both nations are members of OPEC. Both have had to defend the right to control their nation's natural resources. Both nations have supported a multipolar world and both insist on their national sovereignty. Washington considers Venezuela a threat to its national security and foreign policy. Even though Venezuela has no military bases outside its territory, seeks regional peace and has served to broker a peace accord to end that long civil war in Colombia. Washington considers Iran an adversary, not only in the Middle East, but now in its quote, patio trasero, backyard Latin America. And to bring us up to date, in 2018, the Trump administration unilaterally walked away from a nuclear accord that was hammered out in 2015. And this began an intensification of the adversary relationship to Tehran. The assassination of Iranian General Qasem Soleimani last year sent shockwaves not only through Iran, but through the entire Middle East and world. Venezuela has suffered paramilitary incursions from bases in Colombia and even assassination attempts that included the target of President Nicolas Maduro himself. Recently, the U.S. has ramped up its military presence, both in the Persian Gulf and the Caribbean, and the threat of war right now in both cases is real. All of this is happening while both Venezuela and Iran are trying to deal with the pandemic, and the sanctions regime makes it extremely difficult to get the urgently needed medicines and other supplies to combat COVID-19. Let's start with Professor Kovalik, what is your assessment of this Venezuela-Iranian relationship? And how do you see this playing out uh, in the context of a transition to a new U.S. administration? Well, to me, it's a very inspiring relationship that these two countries have. We have to remember that both are members of the non-aligned movement. And in fact, for a number of years between 2012 and 2019, Iran and Venezuela would switch off as being uh, president of the uh, non-aligned movement. And so they have this common belief in international solidarity, particularly between countries of the global south. And I think that is what has to be underscored here. As you note, the two countries are in many ways very different. Um, obviously, Iran um, has, you know, an Islamic leadership. Um, Venezuela is a purely, you know, secular state which aspires to socialism. But I think, in terms of the solidarity they show with one another, really that transcends any differences. Um, and I think, too, from the point of view of Iran and their interpretations of Islam. They believe that solidarity with the poor of the world is required uh, by their religion. And uh, that is something which is, is quite encouraging. And again, what we've seen from Iran, uh, just very briefly, and, and Fawad can, can say a lot more about it, we've seen these tankers of gasoline being sent from Iran to Venezuela. Now, people may, just so I can explain why they need that, because people say, well, Venezuela has plenty of oil. Why, why do they need gasoline? And in fact, sometimes you'll read in the news that they're being shipped oil, but they're not. It's processed oil. 
um, because the sanctions have prevented Venezuela from getting chemicals and supplies and parts necessary to uh, convert their own oil into gasoline. And so, and they need gasoline, you know, for basic uh, things such as electricity, which fuels, of course, uh, water stations and um, it fuels, of course, the internet. Um, without the elect, without the gasoline, um, they can't function. Of course, they need it for their vehicles, etc. So, um, Iran has been very critical in filling in that gap, not just with um, gasoline itself, but with parts and with experts that have been sent for, uh, to Venezuela from Iran to help maintain um, their um, oil. Uh, facilities and gasoline conversion uh, facilities. The one thing about Iran that people have to remember is they're much farther down the road than Venezuela in terms of having a truly independent economy. They have been under some sort of sanctions by the West since 1979 when the people of Iran overthrew the murderous Shah that the U.S. had installed in 1953 when they overthrow um, uh, Prime Minister Mohammed uh, Mosaddegh. So Iran has had to learn how to be a self-sufficient economy. And I was just reading uh, in preparation for this meeting, a very good article from uh, Foreign Affairs from uh, September of this year, September 17, 2020, that talks about how Iran now is getting more revenue from non-oil, um, you know, manufacturing um, than from oil because it is it is managed to retool its economy in response uh, to these sanctions. Something that they're helping Venezuela learn how to do. Just a, one follow-up question here uh, is. Uh, that uh, these tankers that uh, have brought uh, needed fuel uh, to Venezuela, um, some of the ship captains and companies involved uh, have been sanctioned. Uh, and yet, uh, Iran continues uh, to send shipments. There's um, some indication that there's some uh, tankers still on the way. Uh, so it seems that this goes beyond uh, a natural alliance, and really uh, there have been bonds of solidarity built over the years. Can you comment on that? Yeah, well, I think that's absolutely true. I mean, there's no doubt that, that, that it's fair to say that countries like Iran and Venezuela, and of course, you know, China, Russia as well, other countries under U.S. sanctions have been forced together um, by circumstances to assist each other. But I it must be emphasized that it is more than that, that there is a morality that um, and an ethics that motivates both Iran and Venezuela to help other countries that are suffering. Even recently, uh, Venezuela um, sent supplies to Bolivia when it was having uh, shortages. You know, Venezuela, along with Cuba, have sent doctors throughout the world, particularly to Haiti. Uh, we recall that after the earthquake in 2010 in the, break, in the outbreak of cholera, that the New York Times admitted that Venezuela and Cuba were at the front lines in the fight against cholera. And again, I Iran has the same ethics and morality. At the, uh, at the outset of the pandemic, uh, the president of Iran said, we need solidarity, not sanctions. And he meant it. Um, and so, yes, we are seeing Iran take great chances in sending uh, these, uh, the, the gasoline uh, vessels to Venezuela. The U.S. has threatened every time that it was going to stop them, seize them. Uh, in one case, uh, the U.S. seized two Greek uh, vessels that were shipping Iranian uh, gasoline. Um, so yeah, they're taking a real chance to continue doing this. And frankly, they're taking a chance that the U.S. will use something that happens in the Caribbean with 
these vessels uh, to start a war with Iran uh, and or with Venezuela. You know, it, it's very clear that in Trump's final days, he's been looking for a way to start a war with Iran. You know, we see the murder of the nuclear scientist a few weeks ago. Um, there was intelli- uh, There was a recent article uh, very shortly after Trump lost the election in which he had a meeting with his national security advisors uh, in which he floated the idea of a preemptive strike on uh, Iran's nuclear enrichment facilities. Um, so this is a dangerous time. It's a time when some people, some countries, um, instead of reaching outward, might look inward and worry only about themselves. And Iran would have every right to do so. That Their economy has been crippled by these sanctions. People are dying in that country because of these sanctions. People are dying in Venezuela because of these sanctions. There's that one study. I don't think they've done a follow-up, but it was a study by the, by CEPR, the Center for Economic Policy Research showing before the pandemic, in Venezuela alone, between 2017 and 2018, they estimated that 40,000 Venezuelans died due to U.S. sanctions. Due um, to the, yes. No, go ahead. Yeah. And um, we're seeing similar things happening in Iran. These sanctions are aimed, we have to remember, at women and children. That We know that that's who is injured by these sanctions. There was a great UN study on the sanctions against North Korea, which show that there with the, with the UN sanctions there. We, of course, remember tragically the sanctions uh, regime against Iraq in the 90s. We remember when Madeleine Albright famously said it was worth it that those sanctions killed 500,000 children. These are, are, are anti-personnel sanctions, as deadly as any bomb, right? And again, Iran and Venezuela could just say, okay, we're just going to hunker down and worry about ourselves. But they believe in international solidarity and they're acting that out. Yeah, Iran has indicated that uh, if the sanction regime is dropped, uh, it will consider returning to the nuclear accord of 2015. The European Union didn't want this accord to fall to pieces. It was the U.S. that unilaterally uh, walked away from it. Do you have any expectation that this relationship uh, between the U.S. and Iran uh, may change with the incoming administration? There's some hope for that, right? So first of all, we have to remember that it was Obama that entered into the nuclear deal with Iran. And of course, at that time, Joe Biden was his vice president. Biden has said on a couple of occasions that he is open to reentering that nuclear deal. Um, So there is some hope there. But of course, um, you know, Trump has tried to put the incoming Biden administration in a corner uh, where it's going to be harder to do that. Um, I think it's up to people like us, frankly, to pressure the U.S. to reenter that deal and to uh, get rid of these sanctions. Um, I'll just briefly say that in terms of Venezuela, I really don't see any change in policy there with the incoming Biden administration. He's been pretty clear um, that he will continue the same um, regime, sanctions regime against Venezuela. But again, with Iran, there may be some some hope there. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Uh, I have a, we have a question. We have a question from our uh, senior fellow, um, Danny Shaw, professor from New York. Uh, Dan, if you have, uh, please unmute yourself so you can ask the question. Thank you. Good afternoon uh, for both uh, panelists. There's a lot of debates in the uh, US left about the character internally of an Iran or a Zimbabwe or a Venezuela or a Cuba but how can we appeal to broad anti-imperialist forces, as the Kiao Collective said uh, in these very days, that we don't get caught up in the internal challenges or contradictions, but that we maintain a broad anti-imperialist support for all those countries in the crosshairs of U.S. imperialism? How can we further our educational efforts in that direction? 
Well, I think that's a great question. You know, Iran is not a leftist government, right? It's not the type of government that leftists necessarily uh, are used to supporting. But again, Iran plays such a, a critical role uh, in the world in many, in many ways. I mean, first of all, in my view, and I, thanks to Fawad, by the way, I visited Iran in 2017. And anyone who visits Iran will find one of the most, you know, advanced, um, civilized, for lack of a better word, intellectual cultures um, that you'll find anywhere in the world. It's a place, uh, you know, where women uh, are active in every sector of the economy and have an important role in society. It is a pluralistic society in which many uh, religions prosper. In fact, I saw that the Supreme Leader sat down. I saw a video. He sat down on Christmas Eve uh, with a Christian family in Iran. I saw a Christmas tree there uh, to show his solidarity with the Christians in Iran. Iran has the second largest Jewish population in the Middle East. And their community leaders have been very vocal that they are happy there and treated well there. There is a, uh, a Jewish hospital in Tehran that has received millions of dollars in support from the government. This is the type of country and government that I do feel people can feel good about supporting. And again, um, oh, by the way, I need to quote Anthony Bourdain here, the late Anthony Bourdain. I hope I'm pronouncing his last name right. The famous chef who went around the world, he had that show. And I agree with him that um, the Iranians are the most hospitable people on earth. You'll never be treated better um, by anyone. And again, people need to understand that those are real people, good people that are suffering due to these sanctions. The other thing about Iran that I admire is frankly, they're probably the staunchest supporter of the Palestinian people. And one of the last in the region, right? As, as, as the Gulf states have totally sold out to the West, um, Iran stands as a bulwark uh, of supporting the Palestinian people. Again, they have an ethic, uh, that government of solidarity, of support for the poor, uh, that again, may not be leftist in nature, but it is a socialist ethos, um, whether they would call it that or not, I believe. Um, yeah, th th that would be my, that would be my take on Iran. Uh, now we're gonna um, we're gonna pass the mic to uh, Ford, uh, but please, uh, Professor Mills, you have a question for him first, right? Yes, uh, Professor Izadi, I'd like to ask the same question. Uh, how do you assess the relationship, uh, be the long-standing relationship between Venezuela and Iran? And also, can you share with us something about the impact of sanctions uh, in Iran? Yes, very good. Um, thank you very much. Uh, an excellent question. Thank you again for the invitation. Uh, I'm talking to you from Tehran, so I hope you can uh, hear me okay. Uh, we, we are very far away from you. Um, you know, as Dan said, uh, the uh, revolution in 1979 uh, was very much an anti-imperialist revolution. Um, the, government that was overthrown was a government that was uh, installed by the CIA and the British uh, the MI6. And uh, the Shah's government caused a lot of difficulties uh, for uh, everybody, basically, in Iran, except uh, people very close to him. And uh, the United States was uh, the main supporter. And when you read the history of uh, Iran-US relations, uh, you realize that uh, this happened during the Carter administration. Uh, 
uh, from the Democratic Party. Uh, but at that time, at least, I think President Carter has improved his uh, worldview uh, since he left office. But at that time, the Carter administration uh, had a chance to uh, correct the past mistakes. Uh, and uh, in fact, Cyrus Vance, who was then uh, Carter's uh, Secretary of State, uh, advocated uh, for that idea. But then we had the late uh, the big new Berzhensky, uh, Carter's uh, national security advisor, that uh, basically uh, did not accept that idea. And uh, the result was that the continuation of the Carter administration for the Shah until the last day. Uh, so that uh, history uh, continues up to today. Uh, you had uh, you have the Biden administration coming in in, in about ten days, uh, and uh, they have a, a chance to correct uh, Trump's uh, uh, failed policies against Iran. And from what we read uh, from people around uh, President Biden, I think he's going to continue some of uh, Trump's policies against Iran, which is uh, which is quite uh, disturbing. Uh, so uh, uh, we have this history of uh, U.S. intervention in Iran, U.S. coup d'etats, U.S. sanctions that have resulted in the uh, killings of uh, many, many Iranians. Uh, when the revolution happened in 1979, uh, just about a year or so after the revolution, uh, Iraq, Saddam Hussein attacked Iran, and that created a war that lasted for eight years and thousands of people were killed. And uh, we had people like uh, Rumsfeld, who later on became uh, George W. Bush's Secretary of State, visited Iraq. The famous video is seen by everybody. And the United States basically supported Iraq for most of that eight years in, in the war against Iran. The US government uh, provided intelligence uh, they knew that Saddam Hussein was using chemical weapons against Iran, and they continued to provide uh, satellite images of Iranian troops uh, to Saddam's government, and then Saddam would use chemical weapons against those people. And then satellites that belonged to the United States took pictures again and gave it to him so he could have more accurate uh, targeting of Iranian troops using chemical weapons. Uh, so this is a very brief history of U.S. Uh, policies towards Iran in the last 60 or 70 years. And then when you look at U.S.-Venezuela relations, you more or less say, see the same type of uh, atrocities, more or less. Sanctions, uh, coup attempts, uh, support for dictators. Uh, you know, they, it seems that people at the U.S. State Department and the CIA copy and paste policies when they want to attack, uh, attack countries. So when, when you have two people, in, people in Iran and people in Venezuela, basically suffering from the same policies, uh, they uh, are going to uh, try to unite uh, to uh, fight against this type of uh, policies. And that's what has happened. So we had uh, in 2001, uh, President Hugo Chavez uh, visiting Iran for the first time. And, and then uh, every year or so, he continued to come to Iran. And then you had Iranian presidents visiting. Uh, as you know, the economic linkage is quite extensive. And um, Iran is honored to be able to help the Venezuelan uh, people with the gasoline that they need with the technical assistance that they need. Uh, and it, it is a responsibility of not just Iran, but other countries to help uh, the people who are suffering. Uh, and, uh, and they're suffering because you have sanctions and, and difficulties that, 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 uh, that the United States has created. And let me also add this point that although um, the Venezuelan government uh, likes to be a socialist government. 
and uh, the Iranian government likes to be an Islamic government, uh, there are more similarities that, than, than one would expect. And the reason uh, is that in Iran, uh, the people who organized the 1979 revolution uh, belong to the class of clerics that uh, followed uh, what we call in Latin America, liberation theology. You know, we have uh, people in the Islamic faith uh, that are basically thinking in the same lines of people who are uh, in, in Latin America, the clerics, the Christian clerics in Latin America, uh, inspired to ideas that are quite similar to Muslim clerics in Iran and elsewhere in the Middle East. And the basic message is that if uh, you are follower uh, of God, then God's uh, uh, people, the people who were created by God, um, should not suffer. And so it's a social responsibility of the clerics uh, and religion to help these people. So that ideas behind uh, liberation theology inspired the revolution in 1979 in Iran. And I believe uh, these ideas uh, inspired Hugo Chavez, who was, uh, uh, who was a socialist and at the same time, someone who uh, was a uh, practicing Christian as far as, as far as we can tell. And so there are similarities in, in, this, in this area as well. Although uh, Iranians are generally Muslims and Venezuelans are generally Christians, they follow the basic teachings of uh, liberation theology. And uh, so that, that line of thinking leads government that follow, follow these principles to provide social services to the poor. And if you go to the United Nations uh, Human Development Index site, as you may know, the United, United Nations has this index that deals with the country's education, country's health, country's general well-being of the people. And you look at the data, UN data on human development index, and you see uh, Iran uh, is doing quite well in terms of growth. So if you look at uh, the data from 1980 to 2020 for, for the last 40 years, uh, Iran is actually number one in the world in terms of uh, growth in human development index. If you look at the last 30 years, South Korea becomes one, Iran becomes second. Uh, and that the reason for, for being number one in human development index growth is because before the 1979 revolution, uh, the Shah's government was plundering Iranian resources and was uh, buying all the weapons that the United States dictated to him to buy and sort of uh, using the money to uh, uh, enhance uh, his own position. Uh, and then after the revolution, the people who took over were generally from the villages. You know, the, the clerics generally are not from the big cities and they're not from rich families. So because of maybe social, social economic reasons, they, they helped their own part of the country, their, their own villages. And that resulted in uh, Iran actually becoming number one in terms of human development index growth. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons that the government here continues to function is because when you help the poor, uh, the poor uh, would like the government that's helping them. So both the Iranian government and the Venezuelan government have this backing of the lower segments of society because they know that this government these governments are helping them uh, and governments that are inspired by you know, liberal economic thinking are going to destroy their life. Um, so although uh, the Iranian government and Venezuelan government on the surface are, are different in terms of uh, ideology, 
they are actually much closer than one would think because of that liberation theology and dedication to the poor that was part of the Iranian revolution and it was part of Hugo Chavez's uh, uh, ideas and aspirations when he came into power in 1999 in well, Venezuela. There, there are some uh, questions from the council and then later uh, from other participants. There's so much uh, to talk about in what you said. Um, there's uh, issues to, to be explored, you know, with regard to 1979 and the relation with the left. Um, but I'm going to turn the mic over to uh, another council member, Patricio. Thank you so much, Fred. I want to welcome a, again all of you. We have more than 80 participants, which is a miracle in this era of so many webinars. So I congratulate you for the patience and for the commitment for academic analysis. Uh, this is Patricio Zamorano, again, co-director of the Council on Hemispheric Affairs from Washington, D.C. Before me was speaking uh, Frederick Mills, Professor Mills from Bowie State University, and, and also co-director of the Council on Hemispheric Affairs. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Isadi. We, we have a question from another member of our council. We have uh, Jill Clark Gallup, uh, uh, she's our associate editor and translator. So please, Jill, do you have a question? You have the mic. Thank you, Patricio. Thank you. It is so encouraging to see Venezuela and Iran working to get around the sanctions that bodes well for the dozens of countries and millions of people living under the yoke, living and dying under the yoke of sanctions. But it also uh, bodes well for all of us for a future multipolar world. And I'd like to ask our two speakers to talk about what repercussions they believe this could have for multilateral institutions and for the role of the non-aligned movement. And thank you all for being here today. Uh, Fawad, do you want to take that first, or you want me to take it? I think it's your turn. Okay, fair enough. By the way, thank you for your remarks. Uh, I, I'm learning a lot today uh, myself, particularly about the liberation theology, which is something that is, uh, particularly in my younger days, was a very important motivation uh, for the work I do. Um, yes, I think that Venezuela and Iran, again, which are leaders have been and continue to be leaders in the non-aligned movement. I think their relationship and I think what they're showing they can accomplish with that relationship will help build a multipolar world. I mean, we're seeing that um, already. And I think, of course, it's going to be key, um, their relationship also, again, with Russia and China, uh, which have uh, bigger economies. Um, it's it's a necessary thing, you know. The U.S. at least the last I looked, they were sanctioning like 35 different countries, representing about a quarter of the world's population. Can you imagine that? And so, and because the U.S. at least for the moment still c controls the U.S. banking system and economy, because the U.S. dollar is still preeminent in the world. Um, the U.S. can effectively sanction these countries and impoverish them. And so, again, the world that I mentioned uh, that's being sanctioned by necessity are going to have to come together. And the irony of irony, I see someone just said 39 countries are now under sanctions. Uh, thanks for that post. Um, the irony of ironies is that what the U.S. is doing by these sanctions it's going to sanction itself out of the world economy. It's going to make it so that the U.S. dollar cannot be relied on by many countries. And that's already happening. The countries I just mentioned are starting to find ways to trade outside the U.S. dollar. Uh, and I think you're going to see that uh, more and more. And again, ultimately, the U.S. economy is going to be hurt by these sanctions. We, we are taking ourselves out um, of the world economy. Um, and, and I do think a multipolar world is being built. And that is frankly why, and, I, I, and then I'll end my, my remarks on this, that's why the U.S. is acting the way it is. It's desperate. It knows that its goal of being the only superpower 
a goal it had for a very short time after the collapse of the Soviet Union is slipping through its hands. That's what makes the U.S. even more dangerous. I think it's willing to do very um, violent things to try to maintain that, um, you know, its aspirations of a unipolar world. Uh, and again, it's up to Americans to really reject that. Thank you so much, Dan. Uh, Professor Isadi, do you want to add something else? No, I think, uh, as Dan said, uh, the United States uh, has been following policies that's isolating the United States uh, more than anybody else. So imagine if uh, Iran was not under sanctions and Venezuela was not uh, under sanctions. You would not have uh, Venezuela and Iran cooperating given the fact that uh, they're quite uh, far away from each other. Uh, and you know, I visited Venezuela two times in, in the last uh, five, six years. And, and when I go to Venezuela, I feel I'm, uh, I'm in Iran because uh, in terms of uh, cultural issues, in terms of um, uh, not, not seeing racism, <laughs> You don't you don't do that when you go to some some other countries. Uh, you know we, uh, we we don't see racism when we go to Venezuela, and I think one reason for harsh U.S. policies towards these two countries historically has been has had a level of racism in the background at least. Uh, you know brown people are not supposed to be cooperating with each other in that manner. Uh, so uh, the United States has tried very hard. The US foreign policy uh, aim has been to uh, isolate Iran and US foreign policy aim has to be to isolate Venezuela. They have tried to isolate these two countries uh, under the slogan of human rights, which uh, you know it's surprising to me because when you sanction millions of people, um, uh, you're violating their human rights. Uh, and you, you saw, I think Dan mentioned this, or uh, uh, Frederick mentioned this, that Iran uh, uh, you know, has some money outside the country, in South Korea, in uh, India, in other places. Uh, these are foreign currencies. And Iran wants to use this money to pay directly uh, to uh, vaccine companies to be able to buy vaccine for uh, coronavirus. And the US is uh, not allowing that uh, to, to, for Iran to use its own money to pay. They don't want to get the money into their hands and then give it away. They want to just send the money directly to that vaccine company. And, and the US is not allowing that. And then they talk about the, the issue of human rights and they have this, um, show of concern for human rights. But when, when, when people face this type of uh, difficulties, uh, uh, then the end result is going to be more cooperation and more closeness. Uh, and, uh, and in terms of, and, and as you know, we are moving towards a multipolar world anyway. Uh, and this is generally the consensus of uh, a, a lot of literature, including some that it's produced by U.S. government outlets. The National Security Council had this uh, war, uh, Global Trends 2030. It's available on their site, which talks about uh, by 2030, which is just nine years away from now, there will not be any hegemonic powers. At least that's what they say. And you know, National Intelligence Council is one of the 17 uh, organizations that formed the U.S. Uh, 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 national uh, uh, security uh, apparatus. So uh, overall, uh, I think we are moving uh, uh, towards a better situation. I'm, I'm quite uh, uh, hopeful uh, that as uh, these policies uh, fail, uh, people in Washington hopefully sooner or later realize that continuation of these policies are not going to achieve foreign policy goals. Uh, and 
with the Biden administration, I think the American left has an opportunity to make sure that people who occupy important positions in the US government uh, are learning the lessons of the past, not following the uh, previous mistakes. Uh, I'm a little disappointed with uh, some of the appointments and I see uh, some progressive organizations in the United States opposing some of the appointments that, that are taking place. And I think that, that probably should continue. Not because I, I sit in Iran, it's because its policies fail and it, when policies fail, it's going to affect people in Iran and it's going to affect people in the United States. So overall, I think we are moving towards a, a better direction. Uh, the Trump administration uh, called Iran, Iran policy the maximum pressure campaign. Uh, and, and it obviously failed that Trump is being kicked out of the White House uh, and, and Iran continues to live. Uh, and all the demonization that they had towards Iran and they have had towards Venezuela, it, it seems it, it, it's not paying off. Um, but, uh, thank you so much. So forth, uh, and, and, and I thank you for this uh, type of programming because as we more talk more about these issues, I think, uh, we are going to affect, affect things positively. Thank you so much, Professor Isadi. Uh, we want to recognize as well, uh, besides the almost 90 participants, thank you so much for being here. We want to recognize our sponsors. Uh, this event had the support of several uh, amazing organizations from Washington, D.C. and the United States. We want to recognize Code Pink. I believe uh, Media Benjamin is actually among the audience. We also want to recognize the Alliance for Global Justice. Thank you so much for all the support. Uh, also, Black Alliance for Peace was part of our um, co-sponsorship. We also have Popular Resistance. I think Margaret Flowers is in the audience. Thank you so much, Margaret, for all the support. We also have the support of the COVID-19 Global Solidarity Coalition. We really appreciate uh, your assistance in promotion and distributing this um, this event among your uh, your uh, followers and um, followers. I'm sorry. So we also have another question from another of our senior fellow uh, researchers. Uh, I want to welcome uh, a renowned journalist, uh, independent journalist, uh, Alina Duarte. Alina, please, you have the mic for your question. Thank you, Patricio. Well, thanks again, Professor uh, Dan and Fodi Sadi for being here. Uh, first, well, now that I hear uh, Professor Fodi specifically saying that the uh, administration Biden has the opportunity to learn from the past, what would be those main differences that you are expecting uh, or that we can wait uh, that we can, yeah, the, the changes under uh, Biden's administration towards uh, Iran and Venezuela. And also, well, I'm Mexican, I'm in Mexico. Uh, I would like to ask uh, what should be the role of the movement, the international solidarity movement uh, to stop this kind of sanctions and also to take advantage that most of the people I can see here are from the US. And uh, maybe what should be our role in this case? Thank you. Uh, Professor Isadi or Dan, who wants to take that uh, question? Go ahead, Professor Isadi. Um, it's your turn, but I'm going to help out. Um, you know, um, I read in the uh, in, in the news that. Uh, uh, there's an organization, a progressive organization that has provided the Biden administration with uh, uh, about a hundred names of very capable people who could uh, occupy uh, positions of power uh, in the Biden administration, in, uh, in the foreign policy establishment. Uh, people who uh, are uh, sort of have an, a progressive outlook. Um, so, you know, people, the policies happen because 
people make them. So if you have people who are not progressives, people who uh, belong to the military industrial complex, people who uh, benefit from uh, wars or profit from wars, uh, then you're going to have wars, you're going to have sanctions, you're going to have difficulties. Uh, and then if you have people who have some level of uh, conscience and refrain from uh, killing innocent people through sanctions and other means, then they're going to follow different policies. Uh, so I, I think uh, given the fact that uh, President Biden became president because of the vote that he got from the African-American community, because of the vote that he got from the lower segments of uh, the uh, American society, because of the vote that he got from the Mexican-American community, you're, from, you're in Mexico, and then uh, it would be uh, logical uh, for him uh, to uh, not just have faces, for example, some Mexican-American appointed to some position, having a, a Mexican-American face is not going to be enough. Someone who cares about changing US, historical US policies towards Latin America that, that has negatively affected people. So, so the ideas of people, it's going to be more important than the race, basically. Uh, we have seen the Biden administration uh, is quite careful with regard to uh, making sure that different minorities are represented in the government. But we need to make sure that these people not only are minorities, but also care about minority issues. And we don't, I don't think we see, we see enough of that. Um, and uh, because I, I, I'm afraid that if Biden continues uh, the same policies of the past, uh, then because the US position internationally is not as great as it used to be, uh, then he's going to lose a chance to basically uh, create a foreign policy that's going to be beneficial for the United States. So it's, it's not just a matter of uh, people who are being affected by negative foreign policies. It's also an, an American issue. And when you when you follow failed policies, you're going to fail again. Um, and uh, you know when your new president in Mexico uh, was elected, uh, we in Iran at least became quite happy because he was famous to have this progressive background. Um, I, I don't follow Mexican politics enough to uh, uh, sort of know how well he is doing domestically and internationally. Uh, but I think. As time passes, uh, a lot of countries, including Mexico, uh, realize that uh, the world is actually moving towards a multipolar system. And in a multipolar system, relying on the United States is not going to benefit anybody. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Isadi. We have a lot of questions in our chat. So um, what I'm going to do is, uh, if you want to uh, speak, out and show your, your your face or your audio please use the little hand you can raise your hand if you're familiar all of us are very familiar with with zoom these days but on the lower uh, depending on your system but normally on your lower right corner you can see like a little hand that you can raise but we have some questions let me see if thomas thomas Rourke, or Rourke would love to uh, ask a question i'm not sure if you want to say it the, Directly, Thomas, you have a question about food security. So. Yes, I will. I will. Uh, thank you. Uh, my first question was, uh, um, how have both countries in the face of such extreme uh, uh, sanctions for so long been able to develop their self-sufficiency in agriculture, um, given the uh, um, sort of in uneven state of their of their industrial production and, uh, and mechanized agriculture is... Uh, well, I don't know. And my second question uh, revolved around the nature of the Bolivarian Revolution and how that really is, uh, is this, uh, you know, uh, we hear Bolivarian Revolution on Venezuela and uh, Islamic Revolution in, in Iran, which in my considered opinion was, you know, a reactionary and uh, uh, anti-imperialist, yes, anti-Shah, but uh, was, uh, 
brought uh, rural, as people have said, rural Islamic uh, uh, and landowners, et cetera, to power. At the expense of the left, the Tuda party was annihilated, as far as I know. I don't know if the uh, oil workers are unionized in Iran to this day, but uh, they were the strongest and most powerful industrial union in the Middle East um, in 1978, as far as I know. Uh, could anyone comment? Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, Don, please. I'll talk about Venezuela and then I'll let uh, Professor Zadi talk about the questions as they relate uh, to Iran. In terms of Venezuela, they have struggled certainly with food sovereignty. It's a bit, been a huge issue uh, for them in the last uh, several years because of U.S. sanctions. Um, the sanctions have made it hard for Venezuela to get food. Food shipments have been interrupted. For example, food shipments from Mexico uh, have been interrupted due to the sanctions. Um, so they are trying to encourage uh, local farmers and local farming uh, through this CLAP program that they have and that they've tried to expand. Again, the U.S. has tried to sanction this food program. Um, but what the food program does is it encourages um, small farmers by buying food from them and then distributing that food uh, to the poor throughout the country. And it has been a successful program. Again, it's been hampered by the sanctions, uh, but that has been something they've been trying to do is to encourage uh, local small uh, farming. And that is starting to really take off uh, in Venezuela. Let me just do a little shout out because I know there's people here from Nicaragua. Nicaragua under the Sandinistas has been incredible in terms of their food sovereignty. They're starting to approach, um, you know, 100% food sovereignty is their goal. Uh, I think they're at, at least 85%. Um, so yeah, and in terms of the nature of the revolution in, in Venezuela, the Bolivarian revolution, um, I mean, it is a, again, a revolution that aspires uh, for socialism. I, I, I think, you know, there's certainly a, a mixed economy now. Um, I think, again, the sanctions and the isolation have made it difficult for them to advance far down the road uh, towards um, socialism, but that is the goal. And um, there is a tension, though, I mean, between um, trying to have a more worker-based economy and dealing with the remnants, you know, of, of the, you know, capitalist oligarchs that have existed there for so long and that the U.S. has worked with. Um, for example, there is this Polar Food Company that Venezuela has had to rely on for food distribution. And at times they've been hoarding food, you know, and, and, and people have been calling for the nationalization of Polar. Um, which has not happened yet, I think, in part because there's concern, you know, whether the government itself could, you know, take over in an effective way to d distribute food. But in any way, um, I think we see with the, the new National Assembly that's just been voted in. And by the way, I think that those were, you know, very important elections. Um, 32% of the population voted for that National Assembly. Over 100 parties ran in that election. Um, I think you will see uh, the economy advance towards, you know, again, um, a more at least socialistic uh, economy. With that, I will turn it over to Dr. Isadi. Yes, thanks. You know, um, I uh, put up a link in the chat area. Uh, that's a link to Iran's uh, constitution. And I would encourage people who are uh, interested uh, uh, about how Iran is doing and the sort of ideological background uh, of, uh, of the revolution and what, what's happening today. Uh, taking, a look at, taking a look at that constitution, I think would be helpful. You know, when the revolution happened, uh, uh, the people who took over uh, uh, did not have any uh, experience running a government. Uh, they knew they didn't like the Shah. They knew uh, 
they didn't like the United States foreign policy. Uh, they knew uh, what uh, uh, neoliberal capitalist uh, system of um, governance can do to a country because they lived it. Uh, so when you look at the US constitution, you see a lot of socialism um, in terms of support for the poor, in terms of unions. Iran has some of the strongest unions anywhere in the Middle East, and I would argue throughout the world. And uh, you see uh, concern for the lower segments of society. And, and I don't, you know, I, obviously the Iranian government has a lot of faults. Uh, so we are not here to uh, whitewash some of the difficulties that the Iranian government has. Uh, but what I can tell you is that since Iran is facing a lot of pressure from outside, and since Iran does not have a lot of government friends, you know, Venezuela is one of them, one of the few governments that actually has good relations with Iran. Uh, Iran, Iranian government doesn't have any choice but to have some level of relationship with its own people, to have some level of popular support internally. And that's why you have the sanctions. The sanctions are designed to uh, harm ordinary citizens. So they get tired of the sanctions, they come to the streets and overthrow the government. And this is what the United States thinks is going to be the better way. The other way is to invade a country like Iraq or Afghanistan and then have difficulties with that. So having having on governments that are not following US dictate to be overthrown by their own people, it is going to be cheaper, uh, cleaner, and more long lasting. You know, you know what happens to occupations. Um, so because of that reason, today, uh, Iranian government is uh, doing a lot of subsidies uh, in billions of dollars uh, to make sure that uh, the lower leg segments of society can eat. So the question that Thomas had was about uh, agriculture. Uh, so you, you look at different models of uh, socialism in terms of what to do with agriculture. Iran is actually following that. And because of these uh, policies that deal uh, with the lower segments of society that Iran is number one in human development index growth. So in, in 1979, the average age of Iranians was, was 55, 55 years of age. Uh, now it's 79. So in 40 years, uh, you you have people living about 24 years more on average. In terms of education, uh, you know about half of Iranian population was uh, illiterate, and now the literacy rate is about 92 percent. Um, in terms of you know in at Iranian universities, majority of the students are females. I, I teach at University of Tehran, so I know. Uh, in, you know, I teach American studies. The first year of our American studies uh, program, uh, PhD program, we had we we accepted five students, and all of them happened to be female. Not because we wanted to have five female students; it was because females are generally smarter than males when it comes to studying. It seems <laughs> so. Uh, and the reason you have this higher level of females going to the university is that a segment of the Iranian population is religious, whether we like it or not. And then during the Shah's time, they didn't send their daughters to universities. One reason was there were so few universities, so there were not a lot of room. And the second reason was that they didn't want their daughters to take off their scarf because that's what used to happen to people that went to universities during Shah's time. Um, at the same time that we criticize Iranian government uh, for issues, the current issues or the problems of the past, uh, in order to be fair and in order not to demonize and not fall into the same rhetoric that uh, 
that's being used by Mike Pompeo, uh, we need to basically look at both sides of the coin. That at the same time that there were difficulties and there were difficulties, at the same time you have progress. And, and that's, that's the only way that the government has continued to live because they don't have any real support outside. They have to rely on their own people and at least the segment of population is, uh, is, is going along with that idea. Thank you, Professor. We have a lot of questions, so we are gonna try to be brief. And we know that we are past the hour, but we have so much interest that we're gonna continue a little bit more, maybe a couple more questions from the audience just, just to close up this great event. We have a question, let's see if uh, Nina Paglicia, or, or Paglicia, maybe in Italian, I'm not sure, if he wants to, if he wants to, uh, open his mic, we will be glad to hear your question, uh, Nin, uh, Nino. Are you available? Yes. Yes. Uh, hi, thank you uh, very much uh, for allowing me to ask a question. Thank you for the speakers. I admire them both. Um, I'm a, a, a Venezuelan Canadian, so I have a direct interest on everything about Venezuela and, of course, the relationship with Iran. But uh, my question is on the issue when we talk about so many countries that have been sanctioned by the US and all the negative consequences of these uh, sanctions, uh, a number of 39 countries uh, have, has been mentioned as sanctioned by the US. I, I'm wondering, and I would ask the speakers to address maybe the idea of a possibility of developing a, a coalition, a strong form of coalition of sanctioned countries. There would be 39 of them at least that could you know, uh, try to offset the negative impact of those uh, uh, sanctions. Uh, you know, those th that coalition could be uh, could make the, the 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 country stronger in terms of uh, politics, politically, and also commercially through uh, trade, and overcome uh, to a certain extent the uh, sanctions. Um, I would like to hear your opinion on that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nino. We're going to ask our beloved speakers to be brief, so we can fit their trying to switch. A couple more questions. Dan? Yes, well, I think, uh, Nino, first of all, I admire you as well. I follow uh, you and, and your work on, uh, in particular, on Venezuela. Um, I think that that is starting to happen. I think that there that is a real possibility. And again, I think we're going to see through the non-aligned movement in particular, uh, that sort of move. I think China is playing a leadership role in trying uh, to do that. Um, we didn't talk much about China, but I think it's at least worth talking about um, and, and, and what they've been doing <coughs> to assist poorer countries uh, economically, infrastructure-wise, and in fighting uh, COVID-19. Again, I, I do think you're going to see this move towards those countries that are being sanctioned, trying to create essentially an alternative economic um uh, trading system. Uh, uh, we also have a, a very good question. I would love to give this chance to Juliana uh, from Brazil. She has a very interesting question. Uh, Juliana, you are uh, online. You can have the mic right now. Gonna, we are going to wait for you a little bit. Um, okay. Well, um, first of all, great event, uh, um, greetings to all from Brazil, a country that uh, until recently used to be a great ally of both Venezuela and Iran, but you know, things has, have changed a lot after Bolsonaro phenomenon. I say that is a social phenomenon to his arrival to power. But anyway, my question is, in addition to the sanctions here in Brazil, and I think uh, all over the world, had a great impact to the assassination of uh, General Soleimani. I would like to know from the, speaker, the speakers if uh, they have any hope that such a crimes will not occur. 
under the Biden administration. Our perspective from here in Latin America is not usually very optimistic, no matter the president of the US. But uh, how do you see this aspect of military now uh, with the new administration? Thank you. Thank you, Juliana. Uh, Professor Isadi, maybe? Right. Uh, you know, I remember uh, when uh, President De Selva was the president of Brazil, and we miss him. Um, uh, he came to Iran. Uh, he had a uh, plan uh, on Iran's nuclear issue, uh, and uh, it was during the Obama administration. Uh, and the Obama administration thought that uh, Selva's plan uh, will not be accepted by Iran. Uh, and when he came in, uh, Iran actually accepted the idea. Uh, and then uh, the President De Selva uh, had talked to President Obama before coming to Iran, and he thought, President De Selva thought, that uh, Obama was on board. But when Iran accepted, then the US uh, backtracked and did not, um, did not follow through. So you may remember, Selva wrote a letter objecting to what uh, President Obama had done. Uh, and so because Iran had accepted the plan and the US had not. And it was during the Obama's administration that four uh, Iranian uh, nuclear scientists were assassinated uh, in Iran. And then we had one just about two months ago, uh, the fifth one that was assassinated. So this type of, you know, they call it targeted killing. I call it terrorism. Um, it, it has been going on. We had it during the Trump administration. We had it during the Obama administration. Um, Israelis are supposed to be uh, responsible for it, but from what we read, at least for the four people who were assassinated during the Obama administration, uh, that uh, they coordinated and they uh, sort of checked, checked this idea of uh, killing Iranian scientists, and it, it seems that they got a green light from Washington. Um, we hope they don't repeat that. Uh, President Trump it became very close, came very close to, to a, a all out war after the assassination of the Iranian general. Um, you know, Iran and United States are not officially at war. So when you kill an Iranian general who was in Iraq by, by invitation of Iraqi prime minister, he came to the official airport using his passport. Uh, when you assassinate people like that, you show that you don't have any respect for international law. And uh, we hope that the Biden administration does not follow Trump's policies, including the policy of assassinating uh, Iranians, whether inside Iran or outside Iran. Uh, uh, but given the fact that, that during the Obama administration, we had people uh, doing things they were not supposed to do, uh, I, hope, I hope we see a change in the Biden administration. I, don't, I cannot tell you a definite answer with regard to Nino's uh, proposal uh, about uh, countries that are sanctioned by the United States to unify and have a unified front, uh, great idea. Uh, I hope I hope uh, policymakers in these countries hear you. Um, I realize that China and Russia are not helping Venezuela as much as they used to. I think the you know the Monroe Doctrine is is. Uh, is you know it's very old, but I think that there were some hesitations in, in the last couple of years, uh, and there, there is this reduction uh, of um, of help that's coming from China and Russia. Russia also has a lot of oil and gas, and they could they could ship gas to Venezuela if they wanted to, but it's Iran that's actually uh, actually doing that. Um, so overall, I think uh, with the countries that, that are facing similar difficulties, uh, more or less, are going to find common ground. And Patricia told me to have short response, and I'm not listening to him. So let me stop now. 
Thank, thank you so much. I'm not sure if Dan, uh, you want to add something, or we uh, hear the last question of the evening of the of the afternoon. I'm sorry. Yeah, I think uh, I think Dr. Asadi covered that well. So let's uh, we probably should should get to the last question. Yeah, thank you so much for everyone who had stayed almost 20 minutes longer than than planned. We tried to be very disciplined, but the seminar is just uh, great in terms of information. Uh, uh, about this subject that is not normally covered by the uh, mainstream um, a cycle of webinars here in Washington, D.C. So we want to uh, uh, offer the last question to David Paul. Uh, he asked uh, in the middle of our uh, conversation. So we're going to pass the mic to David. David, you can unmute yourself. You have uh, the mic for the last question. Well, hi. Actually, I didn't have a question. Uh, the, the person already asked it about food sovereignty. That was going to be my question. So I don't have any separate question. But thanks. Sure. Thank you so much. We also have, we have se several more questions. Let me select yeah, one. Uh, we have a question. If you can unmute your, yourself, Paul, that would be great. Um, we have a, a, well, we have a more of, philosophical question uh, from Paul. Paul uh, Flansberg, I'm not sure you can unmute your, your mic and you will have the last question of the afternoon. Paul Flansberg. Hi, I'm sorry. I, I, I wrote a, a couple. If you have one in mind, I'll let you read it, if that's okay. <laughs> okay, I'll have to find it. If you, is it's in the comments? I know. I, 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 uh, there are some. There's several questions, but you had you picked out. You see one that you're identifying. Feel free to ask that question yourself or read it. Sure. You have one uh, talking about the the indoctrination of here in, right. in the in the U.S. Uh, that's a reminder. Maybe you can elaborate. Um, yeah, in the United States, uh, we're indoctrinated about who the bad guys are. Um, I can't, I, honestly, I can't remember uh, where I was going with that. Um, yeah, you were asking if uh, you can give us, Professor, some clues. Uh, this is more in terms of the uh, social, psychological aspect of this, of this uh, manipulation of information in general, right? That we divide the world from the U.S. in bad guys and good guys. Uh, we certainly that actually engages with the with the old the age uh, uh, concept of the Cold War, right? Uh, that we divide the world in in good actors and bad actors, depending on the fact that if they uh, align or not with the U.S. foreign policy. So you can, you can right. So my okay. question is, who's culpable in in uh, forming that message? So everyone else believes it. Who's culpable? Well, I think, well, of course, um, you have the government of the United States, which, um, you know, just spreads out now propaganda uh, in, the, in the fashion that you're saying. The CIA, for example, does this, and they do it, um, you know, overtly and implicitly through the media and through Hollywood. I mean, we know that the CIA um has paid journalists um there's a case of judith miller at the new york times who was basically a mouthpiece for the cia right and pushing the war against iraq we know this uh we know that uh the cia is actually involved in um you know uh uh approving scripts in hollywood um, there's several books written on this. Um, uh, just to give some examples, you know, in the Black Panther movie, which everyone loved the Black Panther superhero movie, the only good uh, white character in the um, movie was uh, a CIA agent, right? And, and we know that the CIA uh, often... I'll give you just one other um, in Meet the Parent. Uh, if you saw that, Ben Stiller, when he goes into Robert De Niro's lair and he sees 
figures out he's with the CIA. Initially, he was going to find a torture manual on De Niro's desk. But the CIA took that out, said, no, 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 don't, we don't want you to talk about torture, right? And so um, now those are more overt forms, but I think the media in general and the news media in general, and again, go back to Chomsky and Edward Herman and manufacturing consent, they accept the idea of American exceptionalism and they push it. And part of American exceptionalism is that we're good, everyone else is not as good. And then of course, those we claim our enemies are, are bad. And um, it, it, there's almost no dissent about it. And I would say less dissent now in the media about those issues, about who is good and who is bad um, than ever. So I, I would hold the government and, and the media and Hollywood, uh, you know, they're all complicit in it. Um, well, I'll just give one other example is that uh, the Tom Clancy uh, show about the about I think he's a CIA agent. Um, John, uh, I'm forgetting his name. But anyway, the guy from uh, the office, Jim, uh, was in it in the latest season. And um, the whole thing was about him going to liberate Venezuela from clearly someone who was Nicolas Maduro. You know, so these things not so subtly, of course, encourage this idea um, about who is good and bad in the world. And, and really, you know, greases the skids uh, for people in this country to accept the support of, of, of coups around the world. I hope that's helpful. But, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor uh, Dan Kovalik. Uh, I think we're, we're going to close this event now has been a wonderful almost 90 minutes of analysis. We really appreciate all your participation. We have consistently 70 participants throughout all the time that, that talks a lot about the interest on this subject. Uh, again, my name is Patricio Zamorano. I'm co-director of the Council on the Hemispheric Affairs. We hosted this event also with Professor Fred Mills, co-director of COHA and professor of philosophy in at Bowie State University. We, of course, have uh, Professor Fouad Isadi from University of Tehran. We also have our senior research fellows here at COHA, Jill Clark Golov. We have Danny Shaw, uh, Alina Duarte. We also want to thank our sponsors. We have Cold Pink sponsoring this event, uh, Alliance for Global Justice. We also have Black Alliance for Peace. Uh, we also have popular resistance and the COVID-19 uh, co uh, global uh, solidarity coalition. I know that we have uh, still pending questions, a lot of questions. I'm so sorry that we didn't have more and more time. But we invite you to go to koha.org. You can be in communication with us. You can send us messages. You can also submit articles. We are open to any uh, uh, analytical academic articles about the uh, situation between the US and Latin America and beyond. So if you wanna submit your piece, your piece of content, please do so. We will consider it and our editorial board may publish it. Um, I don't have anything else to add. Thank you so much, Dan Kovalik, Professor Fouad Isadi from uh, Iran. We know that for Fouad it's almost midnight there, so we really appreciate your help. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, and please be in contact and be safe. Bye.